Good morning, church. It is so great to see each of you here today on this first Sunday after Easter when we are living in the recognition of the gift of the resurrection. And if you're with us online, we're so glad you are as well. And we want you, everyone to know that this is a welcoming church. All people are welcome. And we hope that you sense that in your presence amidst um, everyone today. I want to draw your attention to our announcements, several things as we prepare for worship this morning. One, it is an honor and privilege to have the very Reverend Dr. Michael DeLashman here as our preacher. Michael became a friend through an accident. Um, I was supposed to meet with someone and they got their calendar swapped and he was um, sent to fill in. And it's been a great friendship ever since. So I am thank God for how the spirit moves. Um, so he will be preaching here this morning. I'm delighted for his first time here at St. Stephen's. Also, I want to welcome Jenny Lehman to the bench. Derek is away this Sunday, and Jenny is a wonderful person who fills in on many occasions. So, yeah, it's always good to have you, Jenny. <laughs> Um, also, you'll see on the announcement page as you turn inside on this front cover, things that are coming up this week. Um, Braver Angels is happening this afternoon, our conversation facilitated by Braver Angels. Um, I hope that you'll come and learn a new way of talking about difficult things. That's the goal. And um, I expect it to be a good time. Also, this upcoming Tuesday, I guess it is, on April 9th, we'll have a Zoom um, event on bullying. Um, I encourage you as well to come to this because it talks about how it shows up in a corporate life, like in the church, and um, you will be strengthened in what you already know, but you'll also learn some things that you might not have known about how it can happen in a church, unbeknownst to people. So I encourage you to come to that. And then um, also, I'm going to be offering a morning Zoom conversation on Thomas Merton's and teachings, and you can see that as well. Most of these things you need to email the church office for so you can get the email, the Zoom link um, um, for that. A couple of other things just about our worship here this morning. We will be celebrating birthdays for April this morning, so please remember that, everyone who has an April birthday, and if we missed you already in this 24 year, um, I hope that you'll come forward as well. And then we will collect loose offerings in the plate for the General Theological Seminary. I sent out an email early this morning about how traditionally the Sunday after Easter has been Theological Education Sunday in the church. Who knew, right? Um, we haven't done it here, but um, it has been tra a tradition in the Episcopal Church for a long time. So whatever loose money goes into the plate, or if you write a check specifically and, and denote in the memo line that it's for the seminary, that will be given to the General Theological Seminary. Um, and so as we begin our worship here this morning, I invite you to take a moment to let the sound settle down around you and inside of you as we prepare for what God has to offer us in our worship today.
Alleluia. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Alleluia. Almighty God, to you. This time, all the children are welcome to follow Miss Sue down for story time. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who in the Paschal mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation, grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. A reading from the first letter of John. We declare to you what was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands, concerning the word of life. This life was revealed, and we have seen it and testify to it, and declare to you the eternal life that was with the Father and was revealed to us. We declare to you what we have seen and heard, so that you may also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we are walking in darkness, we lie and do not do what is true. But if we walk in the light as he himself is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus his son cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. 
If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. The word of the Lord. Let us say together in unison Psalm 133. Oh, how good when brethren meet together in unity. It is like fine oil upon the head, the bronze down upon the ear, upon the ear of Aaron, and bronze down upon the collar of his robe. It is like the dew of Hermon that falls upon the hills of Zion. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Glory to you, Lord Christ. When it was evening of the day of the resurrection, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of the nails in his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. 
A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he reached, and then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Good morning, St. Stephen's Ridgefield. It is an honor and a pleasure to be here with you this morning. My name is Michael Delashmut. I'm the Senior Vice President for General Theological Seminary and Dean of the Chapel of the Good Shepherd. I bring you greetings from the faculty, staff, and students of General Seminary in the heart of New York City where we are proud to count your amazing rector, Mother Whitney, Reverend Dr. Whitney Altop, as alumna and friend. Thank you for inviting me to share your pulpit this morning, Whitney. So if you will indulge me a little bit, I would like to begin by sharing with you a little story from my life, with, which for me resonates a bit with the story that we heard in our gospel morning this morning, that story about uh, the disciples who found themselves uh, trapped in fear and surprised by Jesus. So before and, and since uh, becoming a, a priest, most of my professional life has been spent in higher education, first as a theology professor and then as an academic administrator and leader. The dream that I had initially going into higher education was really all about elbow-patched blazers and pipe smoking. Uh, and in reality, it's basically like any other job, and it required a lot of moving around, particularly in early career. I think by the time that Julia, my, my wife, who's here somewhere, there she is, Julia, my wife, you can, hello, hello, Julia, I'm putting you on the spot. By the time that Julia and I had been married for 15 years, I think we had lived in over a dozen houses, and we had three transatlantic moves under our belts. So uh, about 10 years ago, we thought we had landed that final job for life. I was offered a senior leadership role in a small Lutheran arts college in a city just north of where our families lived near Seattle. It was the dream job in the dream location. We bought a 1910 Craftsman-style bungalow, which was the home we had always dreamed of buying, just blocks away from Puget Sound. We lived in a neighborhood where we could walk the kids to school in the morning and they could play in a pretty safe urban park nearby where we lived. We were in that sweet spot where our families were close enough that they could visit, but not so close that they could visit unannounced, if you know what I mean. So a few years into the job though, things started to get off the rails for us, uh, for the school that is. Uh, I was in my third fall semester in this position and the CFO came into my office to tell me that the school was about to run out of cash, we had maxed out our credits, and by March there would be no way to pay payroll. This launched a, uh, a crazy period of six months where we had many, many emergency board meetings, and eventually it led to a very difficult decision to close the school at the end of the academic year. This, this was a low point for me uh, in my professional life, in my personal life, 
Everything that I thought I had built professionally, the faculty I had hired, the students that I had taught and recruited, the programs that I had launched, all of this was going away. And, and even worse, the dream of living close enough to family, the dream of having this house, the dream of this community, all of this was about to dissolve around me. And I felt myself going deeper and deeper into fear and despair. One night, in the middle of all of this, my mother had planned to come over for a visit. Uh, in the pretense of seeing what we were going to do with our lives and probably also with what we were going to do with her grandchildren uh, since I was losing my job and about to put my house on the market. I can picture this moment so clearly. I was standing by the kitchen sink, washing dishes after dinner. Mom was to my right in the door frame between the kitchen and the dining room with a tea towel in her hand helping me to dry plates. In the middle of this domestic tasks, she looks me in the eye and asks me uh, what I'm going to do. What are my plans now that things are dissolving around me? And I don't know what happened, but all of a sudden I blurted, well, God has brought us this far, and I don't think God's going to abandon us now. I know that this sounds super pious, and it's the kind of thing that you would expect clergy to say, but I can assure you it was not piety or heroic faith that led to this confession, but something within me that I couldn't even articulate. Maybe it was the Holy Spirit showing up in the midst of my fear and despair and giving me that little gift of faith to make it through. Well, just six months later, Julia and the kids and our little dog, Poppy, were driving across the country heading towards New York City for a new adventure at General Seminary. And I was recruited for this new role, and we were open to something new that God was doing in our lives. I tell this story because it's an example for me, from my own life, of how I met Jesus in a moment when I felt locked and trapped in fear and uncertainty. When I read this morning's gospel about the disciples cowering behind locked doors, surprised to see Jesus among them, I resonate with what it's like to encounter Jesus' promise of peace in the middle of fear. So let's dive in momentarily into this text a little bit. The gospel this morning shares with us two stories of the disciples' earliest encounters with the risen Jesus. Our reading this morning spans the first weeks of Jesus' post-resurrection life. The first story takes, part, uh, takes place in Easter evening, and the second story takes place on the following Sunday, what would effectively be today in our liturgical calendar. In the first of these stories, the disciples were hiding behind a locked door in fear for their lives. In John's Gospel, the resurrection... Uh, happens, but the disciples don't hear about it until Jesus shows up. Perhaps Mary hadn't arrived yet, or John decided not to include the Mary story, uh, the, the, the encounter with the, the disciples and Mary in his account. Everything that the disciples had given up at this moment uh, to follow Jesus, their family, their careers, the comforts of their homes, and all of these hopes that the disciples had pinned on Jesus after walking with him and living with him for three years, that Jesus was going to bring about the kingdom of God, that, that Jesus was going to get rid of the Roman occupation, that Jesus was going to bring about a religious revival and they were going to be in the middle of it. All of these hopes and dreams seemingly died with Jesus on the cross. And as those who were known to be public followers of Jesus, it probably seemed inevitable to them that the same fate that, ha that happened to Jesus was going to happen to them next. While stewing in what must have felt like a bitter mix of regret and loss and fear, literally locked away from the rest of the world, the disciples encounter the risen Jesus suddenly in their midst. As he had promised earlier in his ministry, Jesus came to them after his death and resurrection with an offer of lasting peace. Peace be with you, he said. And then he breathed on them, giving them the gift of the Holy Spirit, that presence and active agency of God in the world. The next Sunday, 
the second Sunday of Easter, the story repeats itself again. But this time, the doors aren't locked. They're just shut. And this time, these spirit-filled disciples don't appear to be hiding in fear. Instead, Thomas, the disciple who missed out on Jesus' appearance the previous week, confesses his need for more than just testimony of the other disciples about the resurrection. He needs to see Jesus with his own eyes. As if by miracle, Jesus again appears to this uh, this gathering of disciples, greeting them with peace, and gives Thomas that opportunity to see, in fact, what others have confessed to him in faith. Scholars believe that the Gospel of John was penned somewhere around 60 years after the resurrection of Jesus. It was written to address a small group of second-generation Christians who had likely never had the privilege of seeing Jesus in the flesh, nor likely had met anyone who had personally known Jesus either. They, like us, didn't know Jesus firsthand, but they still knew Jesus. They, like us, knew Jesus through the worship of the church, particularly the Eucharistic meal, shared every week on the day of his resurrection. They, like us, knew Jesus through the Lord's Prayer, through the Beatitudes, through these sayings of Jesus which they, like us, had been taught to memorize by their parents and forebearers in the faith. And now with this new gospel being read in their community, they, like us, could encounter Jesus in the word proclaimed and preached in their midst. The author of John's gospel breaks the fourth wall, so to speak, at the end of this passage when he writes, Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. These words that the author left for those first century Christians mean the same things to us today when we read them. Even though we may not have walked with Jesus, witnessed his crucifixion and resurrection, or or we are still invited to witness him, to meet him, to be part of his life today through worship, through the word preached and read, through the same words of peace be with you. Jesus shows up in our everyday lives, making it past the locked doors of our hearts and meeting us in the midst of our fears, our worries, and even our doubts. In that evening in my kitchen, washing my dishes with my mom in the middle of a time of tremendous uncertainty and fear, Jesus appeared to me with this promise of peace. He gave me the hope that I needed to believe that the one who had taken me this far wasn't going to abandon me now. This is what it means for me to know the risen Jesus today, not just in the story set 2,000 years ago, as our hymn said, in distant Palestine, but in the middle of the complex lives that each and every one of us lives today. So this week, I encourage you to hold this story from John in your hearts as you go throughout your days. Maybe there are moments when you find yourself emotionally or spiritually locked behind closed doors. Perhaps there's a big transition at work or or you're struggling to navigate uh, through the fears of, of finance. Will we have enough money to retire? Will we have enough money to put our kids through school? Maybe it's political fears related to the great division in our country and the upcoming election. There's so much to fear outside that can make us feel trapped, locked away, and isolated from the God who loves us. The good news is that Jesus isn't stopped by our locked doors. Jesus isn't dissuaded by our fears or our troubles or our doubts. Jesus is ready to be with us in the midst of the highs and lows of life, the best and the worst that life can throw at us. And with Jesus, Even if we're locked away in despair, we can begin to find hope and peace and reconciliation and belonging. Amen.
Let us stand now and affirm our faith as we say together the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God. The peace of the Lord be always with you. I invite you to turn and share a sign of God's peace. Peace of the Lord be with you. Peace of the Lord be with you. Peace of the Lord be with you. Welcome. Great to see you here today. Peace of the Lord be with you. I want to invite all of the April birthdays to come forward. <laughs> here we got one. <laughs> you can dance your way up here if you want to. All the April birthdays and any, any March or February or January we missed. We got any April birthdays in this group of kiddos? Oh, Emily, is your birthday in April? Oh, oh, oopsie. Well, let's recognize our April birthdays. It's great to see you. Tell us your name and the date of your birthday. Ted Seibert. Uh, as I say to my doctors when I show up, 04-05-1943. And, and if your math isn't very good, that's 81. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Uh, Michael Alltop, uh, 04. Don't give all the things. <laughs> like give me, you wanted, wanted to hear your social security number too. <laughs> and uh, I can't drive 55. <laughs> um, you don't have to say how old you are, just your birthday. But this, I know this is a fancy way at all. But you don't feel <laughs> obligated. Barbara Lawrence, April 2nd. There we go. <laughs> Nina Newman, April 1st. Oh, lovely. And what about you, Emily? When's your birthday? April 
April 27th, wonderful. Well, let's do a birthday prayer for each of you. Oh God, our times are in your hand. Look with favor, we pray on your servants as, as they begin another year. Grant that they may grow in wisdom and grace and strengthen their trust in your goodness all the days of their life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. amen. We have a little something here for you. As we prepare to bring forward our offerings, I do want to just put in a good word about seminary education. And I know I was maybe a little silly at the start, but I don't want that to be misunderstood. What are institutions of learning that prepare people for the priesthood um, and also lay vocations do for us is really beyond complete understanding. And I can't thank General enough for what I received there. Having grown up Methodist, I found myself always translating everything into the Episcopal lingo and I thought, I need to become fluent. And it was general that made me fluent. I came out smelling like incense, and I thought that was a good sign. Um, so it's truly a gift, and I do encourage you to give to the seminary if, as you can this morning, um, just as an act of faith in what God does in and through these places. Um, and then just a note here too, we will have fellowship time at the rectory today. So just continue on the sidewalk, but go in the White House that says private today. You're welcome in and we hope you'll come and join us because we prepared some good food there for you as well. Um, so that will happen right after worship here this morning and all are welcome. Now, as we prepare to bring forward our offerings, let us hear the words of scripture. Offer to God a sacrifice of thanksgiving and make good thy vows unto the most high.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right to glorify you, Father, and to give you thanks. For you alone are God, living and true, dwelling in light inaccessible from before time and forever. Fountain of life and source of all goodness, you made all things and filled them with your blessing. You created them to rejoice in the splendor of your radiance. Countless throngs of angels stand before you to serve you night and day, and beholding the glory of your presence, they offer you unceasing praise. Joining with them and giving voice to every creature under heaven, we acclaim you and glorify your name as we sing. We acclaim you, Holy Lord, glorious in power. Your mighty works reveal your wisdom and love. You formed us in your own image, giving the whole world into our care, so that, in obedience to you, our Creator, we might rule and serve all your creatures. When our disobedience took us far from you, you did not abandon us to the power of death. In your mercy, you came to our help, so that, in seeking you, we might find you. Again and again, you called us into covenant with you, and through the prophets, you taught us to hope for salvation. Father, you loved the world so much that in the fullness of time, you sent your only Son to be our Savior. Incarnate by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, he lived as one of us, yet without sin. To the poor, he proclaimed the good news of salvation. To prisoners, freedom. To the sorrowful, joy. To fulfill your purpose, he gave himself up to death and rising from the grave, destroyed death and made the whole creation new. And that we might live no longer for ourselves, but for him who died and rose for us. He sent the Holy Spirit, his own first gift for those who believe, to complete his work in the world and to bring to fulfillment the sanctification of all. When the hour had come for him to be glorified by you, his heavenly Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. At supper with them he took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Father, we now celebrate this memorial of our redemption, recalling Christ's death and his descent among the dead, proclaiming his resurrection and ascension to your right hand, awaiting his coming in glory, and offering to you from the gifts you have given us this bread and this cup. We praise you and we bless you. We praise you, we bless you, we give thanks to you, and we pray to you, Lord our God. Lord, we pray that in your goodness and mercy, your Holy Spirit may descend upon us and upon these gifts, sanctifying them and showing them to be holy gifts for your holy people, the bread of life and the cup of salvation, the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. 
Grant that all who share this bread and cup may become one body and one spirit, a living sacrifice in Christ to the praise of your name. Remember, Lord, your one holy Catholic and apostolic church, redeemed by the blood of your Christ. Reveal its unity, guard its faith, and preserve it in peace. Remember Michael, our presiding bishop, Jeff and Laura, our bishops, and all who minister in your church. Remember all your people and those who seek your truth. Remember those for whom we pray on our prayer list. Anne, Tracy, Jack, Larry, Ellie, Fred, Joel, Peter, Claire, Ted, and Nick. And I invite you now to name either silently or aloud those for whom you pray. Remember those in whose memory the flowers have been given, George and Marie Carr. And remember our, our people preparing for confirmation, Porter Bish, George Ferrarone, and Benjamin Olson, and for the adults as well. And remember institutions for theological learning. Remember all those who have died in the peace of Christ and those whose faith is known to you alone. Bring them into the place of eternal joy and light and grant that we may find our inheritance with the Blessed Virgin Mary, with patriarchs, prophets, and apostles, and martyrs, with Stephen and all the saints who have found favor with you in ages past. We praise you in union with them and give you glory through your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Christ and with Christ and in Christ, all honor and glory are yours, almighty God and Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us. Alleluia! Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as holy members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. The God of peace, who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go forth into the world rejoicing in the good news of the resurrection. Alleluia, alleluia.